Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thank you, Mark Gibson, Reed Fischler, Larry Bailey, and new patron Victor. Ooh. Victor. Ooh. On this episode of DTNS, IS Actar tells us which is better between the iPhone 16 and the Samsung Galaxy S24. Epic files a second antitrust suit against Google, and DirecTV is going to merge with Dish. Dirish TV. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, September 30th, 2024. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. From the Big Apple, I'm Aya Zaktar. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We are all out of September. This is all we got. This is the last bit. Enjoy it. Squeeze Tomorrow, it. Tomorrow, it's actually October. So, Oktoberfest, Halloween, all those things that have already been going on in September, <laughs> they'll actually be happening in October, starting tomorrow. School Tober. School Tober. Uh, it's like Oktoberfest hangover. Yeah, it's where you go after Oktoberfest. Uh, Riaz, thank you for being here, man. Yeah, it's always great to chat about, well, everything about technology. So this is going Indeed. to be fun. That's what we do. Let's start with the quick hits. AMD released firmware updates for its Ryzen 9600X and 9700X desktop processors to improve performance, which some have found disappointing. Uh, Windows 11 branch prediction optimizations are included now. You used to have to go out and find them yourself. Now they're just part of the firmware. That should boost performance by 3 to 13%. A BIOS update for the 9600X and 9700X extends the warranty to allow your max power level to go beyond 65 watts all the way up to 105 watts that should give you another boost of around 10 percent, or at least up to 10 percent. there are also some core to core latency optimizations for multi-chiplet models so if you know what i just said that's good news for you and new am5 motherboards with expanded input support California's governor has vetoed a bill that would have required makers of large AI models to do safety tests and install kill switches to prevent critical harms and some transparency reports and such. Governor said the bill focused too much on a few large models and would give a false sense of security because smaller models wouldn't be covered and smaller models could be capable of causing harm. He also said it applied in areas that posed no risk and said he supports a more targeted approach. In other words, it was covering everything on large models, whether they were risky or not, and nothing on small models, even if they were risky. The bill, however, was supported by a lot of longtime AI researchers. So Jeffrey Hinton, Yashua Bengio, uh, a lot of smaller companies like Anthropic supported the bill. It was opposed and heavily lobbied against by major players like Google, Meta, and OpenAI. I didn't read the bill, but nothing says you can't just come up with another modifying piece of legislature, you know, focused on the smaller models. So that's just off the top of my head of like, hmm, something might be afoot. That's exactly what Governor is doing. He is working with people from Stanford and elsewise to create a new bill that he will propose. Sony and Raspberry Pi have announced the Raspberry Pi AI camera module for 70 bucks. Module includes an onboard image algorithm processing for people developing AI using Raspberry's RP2040 microcontroller with Sony's IMX500 image sensor. And that's the one that does the image processing. That means you don't need a separate chip like a GPU to process image AI stuff. That's right. So you can even have AI in your Raspberry Pi and then it'll go bye bye. Yeah, maybe. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman, who is good at knowing things, says that Apple is planning to launch a new OS called Home OS, which would be based on TV OS, along with smart displays sometime next year. Gurman says there are two smart display models being developed, a basic screen, more like what you get from Amazon these days, uh, with FaceTime and smart home controls, and a high-end version you might have heard rumored before, even from German, that would have a robotic arm that could track your face and move to face you, you know, if you're walking around during a FaceTime call or something. The cheaper one, the one that doesn't have the robotic arm, is expected to arrive next year, according to German, with the robotic one possibly not arriving until 2026. You know, I got a lot to say about these smart displays in general and how Apple's going to take it on. But uh, that's for a like, much longer in-depth show because uh, that's that's pretty much that wraps it up for me. Uh. I as hates them. I love them. There you go. That's the short version. Uh, somehow Vivo managed to beat Google and Samsung to the release of Android 15. Pixel devices haven't even gotten it yet. 
that was kind of a big deal that they announced the Pixel devices without it coming with Android 15, and they're not supposed to get it for another couple of weeks yet. But the Vivo X100 series, the Vivo X Fold Pro, and the Ichu 12 all reportedly have been receiving Android 15 updates over the air. Android 15 arrives on Vivo along with its own Fun Touch OS 15, which is their custom skin for Android. You know, I'm supposed to be recommending phones, and the Pixel phones are supposed to be the first one to get Android 15, mm -hmm. and this screws up everything. And before I write an angry email letter to you saying that I, I don't hate smart displays, I just think they're underpowered. They're, they're fine. They're perfectly powered. Epic has filed an antitrust lawsuit in the Northern District of California against Google and Samsung, accusing the companies of conspiring against third-party app stores. Collusion is what they're after. The new suit is about Samsung's auto blocker feature, which prevents users from installing apps from unauthorized sources. Google and Samsung's own app stars are authorized sources. So if you install anything from the Google Play Store or the Samsung Store, you don't have any problem. If you try to install Fortnite from Epic Store, however, it'll tell you, hmm, this is from an unauthorized source, and it won't tell you anything else. It won't tell you, click here to, you know, authorize this store or anything. You can turn auto blocker off. You can even turn it off individually for certain stores, but you have to do it in settings. There's no prompt from the warning prop up on how to do it. Uh, it's anywhere from four to 12 taps, depending on who you ask. Uh, but Ayaz, what, what do you think, first of all, of this practice that has become kind of typical of saying, ooh, that's from a third-party source. Unless you know what you're, we're doing, we're not going to let you install it. I mean, we've been seeing this for a very long time. Apple's had the Apple App Store on its phones, not allowing third-party uh, app stores for the longest time. And they I don't, don't even give either. you the option. Yeah, yeah. Right. They just say, like, like, this is what we're doing with this our device. We're going to keep it closed. And then that became, like, the norm. We have, to the point, we even have a Windows Store, which I still think is ridiculous considering... You can put programs on any computer. So I think that the feature, the auto blocker feature, has been used by so many different manufacturers already under the guise of security. Because if you think about it, these authorized app stores, they can actually go in and kick things off of there if there's anything found out. If I'm running my own third-party store, I could stock it with all kinds of malware based software and how would you know i could always change the name and that kind of thing over and over again so i think epic's going to run into a little bit of issues with this because it is so common practice but it's definitely going to get people talking for the most part because i think if you're an android user you kind of you might know already how to sideload if you're an ios user you might be like we have the option to do what now yeah. The, and, and to be clear, this is only about Android, this particular lawsuit. Uh, if people don't know, Epic won the first lawsuit against Google. They lost the one against Apple except for one provision. They won the one against Google. So Google has to allow Epic to offer its third-party app store. It can't block it. What Samsung's doing is tantamount to blocking it, saying, oh, uh, that's an unauthorized source. And then shutting up and not saying you can't install it, but saying, if you know how to go into settings and install it, then you can go do that. But we're not going to make it easy on you. Uh, I don't know if that qualifies as antitrust because they are technically allowing the third party app store and the third party apps to be installed on the Samsung and, and, and the Google devices. Uh, they are just saying we haven't authorized this where Epic is going to try to argue antitrust is they don't have a way for us to get authorized, right? They're, they're not providing a path to say, well, hey, we're Epic, we're respectable, we have policies to make sure that you know no malware is gonna come through our store. How do we get on the authorized list? Uh, there's, there's, no, there's no way to do that. And so what they're gonna say is the reason there's no way to do it is because Samsung and Google are colluding. They don't have evidence of collusion, but they hope to find it during discovery. I mean, if there were provisions that had ex exclusive items, let's say that the Samsung App Store, the Galaxy Store was the exclusive third party Android uh, app store available for everywhere, I think that'd be kind of a, a easier bet for an antitrust situation. Like you were saying, Tom, you can you can still install stuff. You just kind of need to know how to do it. And just because something's difficult doesn't mean it's impossible. Yeah. I've seen articles that say that like, oh, it's not as easy to just uh, turn off. Apple did the same thing with Gatekeeper. It's a real pain in the neck to, to authorize totally. third-party apps. So, like, if this goes on through, Mac, on Mac, on not Mac, on iOS, but on Mac, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank, 
Thank you for that on, on Mac because it is so annoying when that comes up. And if you don't know, go to system settings and check in Gatekeeper and the re redesigned system settings. It's a pain in the neck. But I mean, it could be up to Epic to educate the consumer. Then it'll be like, hey, look, here's our app store, and here's how you do it. Here's how you do it. Android. Yeah. I don't know if you can convince a judge that having to educate the consumer is enough of a hurdle. You'll be able to convince them it's a hurdle, but is it enough of a hurdle to be antitrust? I also don't think during discovery they're going to find an email uh, from Mr. Samsung that says, let's keep Epic off our platforms by putting in the auto blocker feature. Uh, but maybe you'll find something that implies like this should reduce competition if we do this uh, and that they knowingly knew that was a, a side effect. I, I think I'm less I'm less optimistic than I was even about the first lawsuit. I didn't think Epic was going to win the, the previous one, though, because Android is so much more open, uh, but they did. So I guess anything's possible, right? Yeah, we'll have to see what actually comes out in Discovery because if, if for some reason, Tom, you you find out Mr. Samsung or whoever was <laughs> at the top of Samsung who's not in jail, uh, right? If they find out, oh, we wrote this down and they said please delete this email and we have this cluster f of of a uh, paper trail. I don't think we're going to have that. We're going to see, hey, look, no. we don't want to be handling calls and customer support from people who don't know what went wrong with their phone. So let's ban all third party things unless the user knows what they're doing. Uh, let's move on to another story that's big today. DirecTV has reached an agreement to acquire Echo Star's TV business. Uh, Echo Star owns Dish. So they're going to get Dish TV and Sling TV, which is interesting because DirecTV has its own version of Sling TV called DirecTV Now, uh, which you can get. Uh, all over the internet. You don't have to install a dish or anything. So it'll be interesting to see if they keep Sling TV and Direct TV separated uh, or merge them together. Uh, Direct TV is really just taking on the debt. They're paying $1 <laughs> and then assuming Dish is $9.75 billion in debt. Uh, this solves Echo Star's debt problem and allows them to concentrate on phone service. Echo Star wants to be the fourth major wireless mobile competitor in the US. This takes the debt off the books and lets them focus on that. It gives more subscribers to DirecTV. They'll have uh, a combined uh, 19 million subscribers uh, after this merger. As part of the deal, uh, private equity company TPG is buying out AT&T's stake in DirecTV. Even though AT&T spun DirecTV out, they still own 70% of it. After this is all done, uh, TPG will own the entire combined company. The transaction is expected to close in the second half of the next year. You could look at this IAS and say, oh, this is just the dying of uh, linear cable TV, right? Even though these are satellite companies, uh, it, it's going to all be over the internet now. Um, but they have, you know, two of the existing internet television uh, services. I, I don't know if you've ever used or, or do use either one of these. I actually use the DirecTV streaming service because it's the only way to get the Dodgers in Los Angeles without going through cable. I have yet to use Direct TV or Sling, Orange, Blue, and all the other color ones. Uh, it, it's kind of sad to see that these things are going away because back in the bad old days, if you wanted competition for your cable and you couldn't get another physical cable, you could get a dish or a Direct TV dish. Uh, it, it's it's a little sad, but I'm I'm curious if, like you were saying, are they going to? Uh, streamline things by combining their online offerings or will they keep them separate so they can have two brands maybe one becomes a premium brand and one becomes less premium because which name is worth it do people know sling or do they know direct tv what's going to be the bigger draw uh we've seen that kind of stuff with max when they and and warner discovery sorry discovery and max when they merged we had this uh, kind of messy kind of situation where they kept both services for this for a time so if anything, Direct TV, take a lesson from that. Make sure that you offer, when you are out there offering a new plan, it's not some kind of half broken, half broken service that's not going to work for anybody because you need to have your customers. There's more competition than ever right now. So make something that works. Yeah. It's interesting on that side too, because Direct TV service is probably one of the most comprehensive. Uh, if you want a channel and don't want to pay cable, DirecTV's online service is the way to go. Sling, on the other hand, is the cheap one. If you're like, I just need ESPN, Sling TV is probably the cheapest way to just get ESPN right now, barring Disney eventually launching an, an ESPN-only service. 
Yeah, so that not making me think about how soon before we'll see DirecTV is running into issues with with Warner Brothers Discovery or Walt Disney Company. Well, they already have, right? Well, yeah, they'll, so they'll, they'll they, pull their DirecTV stuff just finished a dispute with Disney where they didn't have ESPN at the beginning of the NFL season. Maybe they'll, just, they'll direct their Disney contacts to Sling when they're okay. It's like, yes, we, we've acquired, aqua hired a bunch of people that you like now, Disney. So yeah. shut up. Well, they uh, they did solve it before this went in, and 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 like we said, this isn't going to close until the second half of next year. So you're not going to see any changes before that. Um, it also might cause Echo Star to be able to focus on wireless and become a genuine five G uh, mobile phone competitor. So keep an eye out for the Genesis brand. That's that's Echo Star's uh, wireless telephone brand. Uh, it, it's going to make a run for T Mobile, Verizon, and AT and T. Good well, folks, what do you want to hear us talk about on the show? One way to let us know is in our subreddit. Submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. New flagship phones from Samsung and Apple were released this year. Of course, back in January, we got the S24 line. Uh, Apple just announced the iPhone 16 at the beginning of this month. Most notable changes to these phones are the cameras, as always. Uh, but there's also some AI integration, at least there is on the Galaxy. It's coming to the iPhone 16. I has just did a PC mag story uh, seeing how these phones stack up based on what we know so far. Uh, these are two of the most powerful phone lines around. You can throw Pixel in there as well. Huawei is in honor or are, are kind of close. Uh, but but these are the two flagship phones most people think of when they think of Android and iPhone. What did you find comparing them? Okay, so when you're comparing the iPhone 16 to the flagship of Samsung, you're basically going to get a powerful device that can do pretty much anything you want because these are the two top lines and Pixel's there too. But like these, let, let's be serious, the S line and the iPhone, they're pretty much uh, on par with each other. What Samsung's got going for it when, it when it comes to its cameras, they have been kind of playing catch up in certain respects in that oversaturated colors in the past uh in the 24 and 23 versions of the s series they've actually toned that down to the point that the 24 is showing much more natural colors so it's mm. a better representation of life but a little bit tweaked it's a little bit oversaturated a tiny bit so your memories can look better than your actual memory so that there's that then you've got apple their photography is excellent so the thing is the hardware level of cameras we're kind of at this point where you can get this hardware. Like, you know, we talk about that Sony uh, sensor on a Raspberry Pi. Anybody yeah, can right. run these sensors on any device. It's really all about the processing. And Samsung has aligned, aligned with Google, and they're really touting Galaxy AI with Google features. And we've been seeing that all year. And it's worked pretty well in my experience when it comes to photography, notes, summer, summaries, just basically anything they said it could do, it's doing it. Meanwhile, we've got Apple talking about Apple intelligence for the past several months, and it's still not out yet. We have yet to see what it can do and if its features can even really come close to what Google can do or even what Samsung can do with its AI, especially for photography. And, and also for things you want to do, right? There's there's the looks great in a demo AI features, uh, and then there's the I actually use that in daily life. Um, and there, there are plenty of people using the beta that have been taking advantage of Apple intelligence, uh, you know, the developer betas out there, but it's not been widespread. So I don't think we have a good sense of that, of like, what are the things that Apple intelligence will be useful for? S24 has had the Gemini powered stuff out for a while now. Do you have a sense of what are the things people tend to use most? Okay. So Gemini is Google's AI thing. And then Samsung uses Google's Gemini if you install Gemini, or you can use Google Assistant. So that's kind of a mess. And if you're wondering which one is which, go to pcmag.com. We've got everything spelled out right there because as you can tell, it's getting real messy. Uh, I've lost sight of your question, Tom. <laughs> what, what, are, what are the things on, on Samsung that, that people actually use AI-wise? Oh. Yeah, so uh, there are, <laughs> like I was saying with the organization of your notes, Samsung Notes uh, is way more powerful than it used to be in that if you scribble your notes, Samsung can actually, with its AI, summarize your notes for you you can actually create an outline of it with either it'll turn it to text or it'll actually change your handwritten notes into an outline form for you it's really quite 
interesting what can be done with just your sloppy, sloppy, a sloppy handwriting. And the S24 and, has a stylus too, right? So you're actually able to do handwriting pretty easy. The S24 Ultra does. And it's the only one that does. And I think this, I think the stylus thing is going to become a really big deal because of the Samsung feature sketch to image. Basically, you can draw anything you want in this in, on your phone. And it, AI will try to interpret what you have drawn. Like basically, in all my demos, I try to draw a cat. And I can't draw a cat. But then it could either make a photorealistic version or it could make a pop art version. And there's something about just trying to do it with your finger. It's clumsy. It's very clumsy to try to draw with that. It's just, yeah. It just doesn't work. I, I, if this finally brings stylus compatibility or pencil compatibility to iPhone, I, that would make sense. Because but if I'm going to step back a little, what a phone can do versus what a phone is going to be used for. Like Apple's Pro line right now is so incredibly powerful that they're they're pushing it as like a movie making machine. Who is doing that and why? Versus Samsung, they are doing a creator focused situation where the features are more for people who are just running around with their phones, not necessarily shooting the next Citizen Kane. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and my sense is Apple is overshooting to impress the same people that Samsung is addressing directly, right? Uh, they're trying to say, hey, YouTube creator, hey, TikTok creator, we could do a full movie here. Imagine what you can do for your channels. Whereas Samsung's like, let's show you directly. And I'm, I'm not sure that it's wrong to do what Apple's doing, uh, but th those are two different approaches, right? Yeah, I mean, Samsung's... <laughs> All those Apple events where you see shot on iPhone and then you see the behind the scenes and you see all the stuff added to the device. I mean, Samsung is trying to show you that if you just take their phone and run around, in theory, yeah. you can get something good. That's that run and guns kind of style versus locking down your production. That's two different approaches. So they are definitely the pro line versus the ultra line. They're they're diverging a bit. Now, I know that your comparison is Apple versus Samsung, uh, but uh, you're covering phones. How, how does the new Pixel 9 stuff slot into here based on what we know so far from it? Well, since Google powers a lot of the stuff we, we've seen in Galaxy AI, so there's there's a lot of parity in their features there. You've got Magic Eraser, which is also on Google Photos on, on iOS. Uh, the Pixel's real draw right now with its AI features is Gemini. Uh, and Gemini Live. Gemini Live is this feature where you can just have an ongoing conversation with an assistant and it retains quite a memory. So an example I actually did was I was trying to find a background TV show to have on while I was writing. And it would suggest, I go, I like these TV shows. It suggested more shows. I go, I've seen all those. And it keeps trying to come up with new ones and you can keep tweaking that. Those Gemini features where you are actually having a conversation that is ongoing and there's a memory that I've seen is very impressive, but that's a pay feature. You have to pay for that. Uh, if you get a Galaxy, sorry, if you get a Pixel 9, if you get a Pro, you get one year of a subscri subscription for that. Later on, you have to pay. I think Gemini could be great eventually with, with the Pixel, but one of the biggest problems right now is that some of the conversations, not some, conversations can be siloed such that if I'm talking about a movie or sorry, television show at three o'clock, and then I talk to it at five o'clock and I want to talk about those, those same shows. It might not remember unless I go into the Gemini app, choose that conversation and then pick up. And let me just say one more thing about this Gemini thing that's going to blow everybody's mind. There's no search function in that app. So if you can't remember where you talked about this thing, good luck. Just search. You can't just ask can't. it. Where did nope. I talk about this thing? Nope. You can't, you can't search it. I mean, you, you can, but you can't it won't type do it. it. Yeah. You would just have to like go per conversation and and just read the transcript until you find it. Gotcha. So, all right, uh, pulling pulling back uh, to to the brass tacks here. Everybody's going to say which one's better, but of course, we both know that the answer depends on who you are. Based on what you've been doing here, who's the iPhone 16 for, and who's the S24 for? Okay, iPhone 16. So it depends on also, we're we talking about worldwide, we're talking about US. In the US at this point, there's enough peer pressure. Who's the iPhone 16 for? For anybody who doesn't have an iPhone or is being peer pressured into having an iPhone. I know RCS is on iPhone, but still, that's going to be the big one. But for its feature set, it's the iPhone 16 Pro, the small one. That one might be the best iPhone out there. It's meant for people who want to be able to pretty much do anything on their phone. Just mm -hmm. short of like a laptop experience, short of an iPad, you can just run as many apps as you want. You can just do anything. That's what the iPhone 16 is and the 16 Pro is for. Great pictures. Uh, 
incredible app support. You know the developers are going to make apps that can really run on this A18 Pro. Please check that if I'm wrong on that one, on the, the system on a chip that's in the Apple iPhone 16s, the Pros that is. These things are monsters, and you won't need to upgrade anytime soon. If you get a 16 or if you had a 15, there's no reason to jump yet until like maybe two or three years later because these, these Apple devices have gotten so powerful, there's no reason to update year to year. Um, and as for the Samsung stuff, who is it for? If you're in the Android world and you want a good ecosystem that you know will be around because you got Google and you got Pixel and that's great, but sometimes it's ecosystem falls apart due to the fact that Google will kill products or try to integrate them with others. And all of a sudden you don't have things that work together. Samsung has worked really hard to make sure that all smart things work together. And they've been around a long time and they keep fostering these these products, even if they don't make a lot of sense. Bixby's not dead yet. So like they keep things going. If you could you imagine if Google had Bixby, how how fast that would have been dead? So Samsung is, is for the person who wants a safe Android, and iPhone is for the person who just needs an iPhone. Needs a, and and it, it's about ecosystem is what you're saying. You know, it, it, which one you want to be in. Ecosystem and what you bought into. If you bought apps on one or the other, just stick to your line. You might want. It's fine to stick with what you got. There's no oh, yeah. big price advantage to one over the other. No, they both started seven seven ninety nine. If I'm talking about the uh, Apple iPhone and the Samsung S twenty four line, it's mm -hmm. really hard to get a bad deal on these things at this point. The Samsung device has been around for almost ten months now, so yeah, you're going to yeah. get a good deal. So even they're going to be a much better deal pretty soon. And Lee points out that uh, Gemini Live uh, just last week, or maybe a few days before last week, maybe ten days ago, uh, is now free uh, if you're an Android user. So, well, get out of here. Yeah, look at that. Awesome. Thank you for that. Thank yeah, thank you, Lee. Uh, and thank you, Ayaz, uh, for that. Before we get out of here, let's check out the mailbag. Dan wrote in regarding our suggestion last week to use random answers for those security questions. You know, the ones that are like, what street did you grow up on? I would like to fish this out of you later and then get into your account. Uh, I suggested just use random answers. Don't answer with actual uh, words. Dan says, additional suggestion, use a random actual word, but not a string of weird letters and numbers like another their password. I've encountered some systems where the recovery is also automated, but it doesn't permit the use of extra characters and confuses it and makes it unusable. Alternatively, I've seen a few situations where it was handled by a human, and when they ask you, what was the name of your best friend in grade school, and you reply back, one, two, three, four, five, A, B, C, D, it can confuse and frustrate them. Uh, the complexity of putting Unicode or emoji characters in those fields would make the recovery in this case challenging and humorous at the same time. Uh, that's funny, Dan. I actually ran into that with a bank once uh, where they said, you know, what's the street you grew up in? And I was like, uh, Z4X. And they just kind of snickered like, oh, well, that is correct. That is what you had in there. So, um, yeah, uh, you, you might want to make it so that it's easy uh, to bandy about uh, or just ignore them and live without them. On Friday's show, Sarah read a mailbag message from Kenny, who said, I thought I misheard and went to the show notes to confirm uh, that Sarah said, don't forget on the Ray-Ban mini glasses, there's a little screen on the inside left lens that shows you notifications when she was reading uh, the email from Kenny. Uh, our, our emailer, Keith, says, is this accurate? Do you have more details on what's being referenced? I'm not familiar with a product named Ray-Ban Mini or any type of screen on the Ray-Ban Meta glasses. Uh, I, I uh, apologize for the error, Keith. There's a notification light. Uh, that's all I can find on the Ray-Ban Meta glasses. There is no such thing as the Ray-Ban Mini glasses. You're not going crazy. Uh, so thanks uh, for asking, though, and uh, apologies and correction. There is no screen, little, no little screen uh, that's visible in the Ray-Ban Meta glasses. Sorry for the confusion. All right. Thank you, Ayaz Akhtar, for joining us today. If people want to find your full breakdown and anything else you've got going on, where should they go? Go to PCMag.com. We've got we got the new reviews of the uh, iPhone 16, the 16 Pro, the 16 Pro Max. They're all done. The S24 line is done. The foldables are there. If you want to compare anything, we've got it over at PCMag.com. If you've got any questions, let me know in the comments on PCMag.com. You can even hit me on X. I'm still at IAS there. I only check that maybe once a month, but I'll answer your questions if you got them. 
feel free, folks. Also, if you're a patron, stick around for the extended show Good Day Internet. I'm going to explain how I can use my T-Mobile phone number on both my iPhone and Pixel Fold at the same time. And then IS is going to tell me why I shouldn't be too excited about that. Stick around for that. We're also going to play a round of AI or not. Can we stump IAS and the live audience? Stick around. You can catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more about that at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow. See you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>